Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. We are so glad you could be with us today for this very timely event. We have a packed program today, so I won't do my normal WIDA commercial except to say, please keep an eye on our website for some exciting announcements about new events, including in-person remarks on US-Africa trade relations by Senator Chris Coons, hopefully coming in April, and a new two-day intensive trade seminar on U.S.-China trade relations that we are planning for May. I, I think today, in some ways, is a is going to be leading into that seminar. We'll get into some, do a deep dive on some critical U.S.-China trade issues. Information on these events and our other activities can be found at our website, www.wita.org. Uh, big thanks to our partners today, the Asia Society Policy Institute, for joining us for today's event. As you know, if you've been on any of our nearly 300 webinars since we kicked off our webinar presence in March of 2020, four years ago this week, we like to give a shout out to people in attendance online, even if you can't see them on Zoom. Over 500 people have registered to watch today's event, but we only have time to give a shout out to four. So welcome today to Andre Von Walter, Head of Trade and Economic Section at the EU Delegation to Canada, Bing Shun Ziang, First Secretary at the Chinese Embassy in Washington, D.C., Alejandro Pescador at the Mexican Council of Foreign Affairs, Comexi, in Mexico, and Namrata Bovija, a Director of Inter Industrial Trade Policy at the Office of U.S. Trade Representative. Welcome, Andre, Bing Shun, Alejandro, and Namrata, and welcome to all of you watching on Zoom. If you're watching on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab on Zoom to ask questions of our panelists, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can during today's event. You should have also received an email with the agenda and a link to see our panelist biographies so we can dispense with lengthy biographies. We have a fantastic panel assembled today about an emerging trade issue that's just starting to get a lot of attention on Capitol Hill in Washington, and judging by the number of U.S. government officials signed up for today's event, also in the U.S. administration. Uh, welcome today to Governor Matt Blunt, the president of the American Automotive Policy Council and a former governor of Missouri. Michael Dunn, CEO of Zozogo, author of the upcoming book. Is it upcoming still or is it a come out now, Mike? Humiliation No More, China's master plan to dominate the electric car markets worldwide. Uh, Ilaria Mazzocco, senior fellow and trustee chair in Chinese business and economics at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Scott Paul, President of the Alliance for American Manufacturing and co-author of the paper that just came out called Why Chinese Autos Could Be an Extinction Level Event for America's Auto Industry and also a frequent WIDA guest. An old and dear friend and former WIDA board member, Kenneth Smith Ramos, partner at Aegon and the former lead Mexican negotiator of the trade agreement that was formerly known as NAFTA and is now known as the USMCA. And my good friend and frequent partner, our moderator, Wendy Cutler, the Vice President and Managing Director of the Asia Society Policy Institute in Washington, D.C., a former Acting Deputy Director, United States Trade Representative, and again, our co-host for today's event. We're delighted. Thank you, Wendy, for uh, coming up with this event idea and bringing it to us uh, to work again together. We're delighted to have you and all of our guests here today. Well, Thanks. <clears throat> thanks so much, Ken. It's great to partner with WITA again. And thanks to our viewers for joining us and for our excellent panelists to discuss a, an emerging issue of attention, as Ken mentioned, Chinese automotive investment in Mexico. Having benefited from sustained and elaborate financial support by the Chinese government for well over a decade, Chinese electric vehicle companies are quickly transforming the global automotive landscape. These companies are exporting and investing in all corners of the world as they're looking for strategic markets to do their business, as well as markets to absorb their excess capacity. And in 2023, to the surprise of many, China surpassed Japan and Germany to become the largest global vehicle exporter. Of particular concern to the United States are the growing inroads Chinese companies are making into the Mexican automotive market and what this potentially means for the U.S. market, for the U.S. industry, and for U.S. workers. While Chinese automotive investment in Mexico continues to be a minuscule portion 
of overall FDI in Mexico. It is rapidly growing as well as Chinese exports to Mexico. In light of these trends, there are growing voices in Congress and elsewhere urging the administration to take proactive steps to ensure that Chinese vehicles do not enter a market and under no circumstances benefit from USMCA tariff preferences nor our low MFN rate for autos. In our discussion today, we're gonna to unpack these trends and concerns. We're gonna discuss what's driving these Chinese companies to invest in Mexico. We're gonna highlight the implications for US auto industry and workers. We're gonna learn the Mexican perspective and we're gonna explore policy options. And we're gonna try and do all this within one hour. And we could not have a better panel of experts to do so. Michael, Alaria, Ken, Scott, and Matt, welcome. So let's get right into the program. And let me start by turning the first question to Michael Dunn to kind of help us set the scene here. Michael, can you help us understand recent trends in Chinese EV production? There seem to be like a lot of companies, a lot of price cutting, a lot of excess capacity, a lot of innovation, and now a drive to export and to invest more. So what's really going on? And um, can you also tell us why is the Mexican market of particular interest to Chinese companies? Over to you, Michael. Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Wendy, and all of the above what you said moments ago. You know, let's look at Chinese automakers today are confronting a simple and powerful reality. It's new for them. Export or die. Why is that? For decades, the Chinese automakers were happy to stay at home because there was growth in profits. That's no longer the case. If we look at the numbers, China today has capacity to build 40 million vehicles a year. That's equal to about half of global demand. At home, sales are around 25 million. So guess what? They have 15 million units of excess capacity. And starting in 2020, we saw exports jump from just 1 million in 2020 to more than 5 million last year, as you said, surpassing Japan and Germany for the first time. There's a pressure cooker at home. If they stay at home, there's price wars. My friends in China who run Chinese auto companies and suppliers say, there's no money to be made at home anymore. We have to find export markets. And there, it's almost frantic, desperate, this desire to go, go global. So they look around the world and they say, where should we go? Where should we land? And they basically are looking at all time zones. So we've seen success in Europe, into places like Israel, South Africa, Thailand doing very, very well. And then probably most importantly for us here in America is what's happening in Latin America. Um, this year, just one example, BYD will sell more than 100,000 cars in Brazil. And Chinese automakers as a group are the number one supplier of vehicles to the Mexican market. That's worth repeating. I think everyone's heard it, but wait a second. The number one supplier of vehicles to the Mexican market is China, both Chinese automakers and in some cases, global automakers who are using China as a platform for export. So how serious is this? Well, 5 million last year, I could easily see China going to 10 million exports a year. Why not? They have the capacity and no one in the world can compete with the Chinese on cost. So this is especially attractive to customers in those countries we talked about moments ago who are more price sensitive. They welcome, wow, I can get a BYD vehicle today for as little as $12,000, $15,000. This is tremendous for many customers around the world. Why Mexico? Partly it's just another market, but more importantly for our discussion today, it presents an opportunity to land on the doorstep of the most important and the most lucrative market in the world still, and that's the United States. So the Chinese automakers have no direct path to the US market today, thanks to our higher tariffs, but they're looking at, you know, Chairman Mao's strategy was take the countryside and surround the cities. And I see the same sort of strategy playing out here 
globally for the Chinese. They're taking the markets surrounding the United States, surrounding Europe, and eventually having the strategy, the intent to enter those markets too. A couple final points. One is how serious or how competitive are they? Just last month, Elon Musk himself said, without tariffs, Chinese automakers will demolish Western automakers. <laughs> it couldn't have been more direct than that. And I would add to that that some people ask me, oh, is this another chapter of, well, we saw the Japanese come in and the Koreans come in and they were a threat, but they settled in and built transplants and everyone sort of got along and lived happily together. Uh, no, this is totally on a different magnitude. You have a industry that has got scale, technology, good products, and low costs, the likes of which the world has never seen before. So what brings to mind is sort of the solar panel story where China now basically has a global monopoly. What is going to stop China from doing the same in autos? That's the question that confronts us as we look at their investments into Latin America and specifically Mexico with the ambition to come here into the United States. Yeah. Well, thank you for that scene, Senator. You've put a lot of excellent points on the table. Let me now turn to Alaria because maybe you can help us understand the, the kind of support that these Chinese electric vehicle companies have been receiving for many, many years. Um, they were one of the 10 sectors highlighted in Made in China 2025 um, and um, have received um, a lot of support, which has led to kind of this unlevel playing field. So can you share with us why is this, why is this, why is the, the field unlevel and you know, maybe you can share with us a little how Chinese companies are, why do they have increased interest in the Mexican market? And how does that fit into their broader investment strategy? Kind of building on what Michael said, a lot of excess capacity um, and a real push to, to go to all corners of the world. Yeah, thank you, Wendy, and thank you for having me on this uh, excellent panel. Um, I think there there tends to be some confusion, actually, because there have been a lot of incentives both on the supply side and on the demand side. So it's worth breaking down a little bit the types of incentives we've seen, especially because on the demand side, so the types of subsidies that allow uh, car makers to reduce the, the price for consumers, most of those are, are gone on the demand side, uh, right? So those are the equivalent of our tax credits here with the IRA in the United States. Um, most of those have been discontinued, but of course there have been significant supply side um, set subsidies, and those are the ones that, for example, in Brussels are being uh, scrutinized very carefully uh, for the anti-subsidy probe. Um, they're, they're, they are sometimes very hard to quantify, to be to be perfectly frank. Um, so of course you have sort of grants and tax credits, but you also have access to finance, right? The the banking sector in China is state owned, so sometimes. Uh, there might be a benefit, uh, the companies may have benefited by below market credit or just even credit that they might not usually qualify for. Um, equity, right? There's a lot of state uh, owned uh, uh, equity, private equity, or you know, venture capital funds, however we want to define them. And in many cases, a lot of these EV companies have benefited from equity injections. NEO comes to mind, for example, very importantly in this case. Um, there are also other even less tangible types of support. For example, in some cases, land is provided at below uh, cost by local governments. Of course, land is state owned in China. Um, in other cases, for example, the, the you know companies may have benefited from um, uh, you know advantageous public procurement contracts or state gu government guidance uh, you know, that have directed a lot of investment to certain sectors, for example, the sectors that have been identified as strategic, like the EV sector, as you just mentioned. So I think there's a lot of different things. I will note that it is extremely difficult to disentangle exactly what has contributed um, to the current, you know, the level of competition we see now, the type of prices the Chinese companies are. It's hard to say exactly what is uh, due to, you know, state support and what is due to actual competitiveness, right? These companies have now developed into um, very uh, sophisticated uh, firms, right? They have scale. They're very vertically integrated. If you look at a company like BYD, they're investing from everything from the mining to the ships that carry the cars, right? This gives them a real cost advantage. So I think it's really sort of a, a real mix 
of companies being able to take advantage of state uh, support, but also companies being really savvy and having a lot of, of investment. Uh, and that makes it a lot harder, I think, as a policy challenge. And now when, as they're going abroad, I think that that becomes sort of the focus of, of trying to figure out how to respond to this, this wave of, um, of these new companies internationalizing. And as Michael mentioned, they're internationalizing, internationalizing very rapidly. Um, I will say, I think, you know, there are a lot of uh, domestic factors, which Michael has laid out, obviously a lot of competition, the Chinese economy isn't doing too well, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, pull factors abroad. So especially when we're looking at Chinese companies investing in other in other countries, um, those countries are often laying out a lot of incentives to attract that investment, especially countries in the global south, but even increasingly in Europe. Right? These are type, this type of manufacturing that Chinese companies are bringing is next generation. It's advanced. It's in some kind of cases countries that may not have that much manufacturing or, or refining. Right? I think if you look throughout the value chain, you're seeing increasingly uh, that the Chinese companies are internationalizing in terms of the um, uh, production of, of batteries, right? Cathodes, anodes, refining, etc., uh, and all the way to the assembly of the car. Um, and that, I think, also complicates the policy response because, of course, uh, it's hard to tell companies not to accept foreign direct investment, um, especially if, if it comes in sort of an advanced industry. Um, and, and finally, I should say Chinese companies have proven to be very receptive and very, uh, very responsive to, um, to policies that the United States uh, and other countries have been placing in terms of de-risking. Right. We find that the companies are responding directly to the Inflation Reduction Act um, and investing in countries that the United States has foreign trade agreements with. Uh, of course, Mexico fits in perfectly into this uh, into this pattern. Um, and I think it's it's not just a question of uh, loopholes, but it's also a question of compliance. Right. And so thinking through exactly what is the letter and what is the the, um, the spirit of the law and, and also thinking through exactly what what is um, acceptable within our frameworks as well. Thank you. Well, thanks much for that, um, for, the, for sharing that information. I think, um, as you mentioned, it is hard to kind of discern what do you attribute to innovation? What do you attribute to government support? And how do you delink the two or can you delink the two? And I think you also underscore that the EU is going to have a tough time as they per, as they investigate these subsidies and try to attach um, dollar figures or euro figures to the amount of the subsidy. Ken, now over to you because um, you know, as Eloria mentioned, a lot of countries they they welcome foreign direct investment. This is a vehicle for increased um, innovation, for more jobs. Um, and for economic development more generally. So can you give us a sense? I mean, you've heard now the US, we're very concerned about what's going on with respect to Chinese investment in Mexico in the automotive sector. Does Mexico share these concerns? And I recognize there's not like one Mexican view. So maybe you can like unpack, unpack for us a bit of how different constituencies may be viewing um, this, the Chinese investment. Over to you, Ken. Yes, thank you very much, Wendy. And first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, WIDA and the uh, Asia Policy Institute for the opportunity to be here with, with this distinguished panel. As Michael mentioned, I mean, uh, Chinese overcapacity is real, right? I mean, and I, and, and in my comments, I want to distinguish what we're seeing on the ground vis-a-vis uh, -vis imports of Chinese automobiles into Mexico versus the investment that we're seeing, because I think we have to separate the two. Uh, what we are seeing is that Asia accounts for 60% of the vehicles imported into Mexico, and China is number one by far, right, with 30% with of the total. They used to be only 12% in 2005, so we've seen a dramatic increase there. So imports by Mexico of Chinese vehicles went up 46% in 2023. So this reflects exactly what Michael was saying, a huge overcapacity in China, looking for markets to, to place their products. And what we're seeing in Mexico, uh, the strategy has been uh, Chinese companies uh, opening up dealerships in Mexico, bringing in one or two models. These models are selling well. And by the way, they're not primarily uh, EVs. We're looking at internal combustion uh, vehicles being sold heavily into Mexico. Uh, and, and so once they, they see that a, one or two models are working, they increase that capacity and they keep bringing in vehicles in, 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 of, of different models. 
So uh, it's interesting to note that 52% uh, uh, of, of the uh, vehicles imported by China are imported, for example, by General Motors. And 75% of the vehicles sold by General Motors in Mexico are Chinese made. So any policy decisions that are taken uh, you know, uh, on, against China will obviously also have an impact on competitiveness of some of these companies. So these are some of the considerations that have to be taken. So yes, we are seeing a lot of imports of Chinese vehicles into Mexico. And, and I have to emphasize that so far, what we're seeing, they're uh, aiming at the Mexican market. Okay, So these vehicles are coming in to be sold in the Mexican market. We're not seeing Chinese vehicles that come into Mexico and try to be re-exported into the U.S. They couldn't do so because of the strict USMCA rules of origin and also because any vehicles that come from Mexico into the U.S. have to comply with uh, U.S. regulatory standards on safety, uh, EPA, environmental standards, et cetera, et cetera. And you have to understand that USMCA has the strictest rules of origin of any trade agreement, right? The, the regional value content, the labor value content provisions, things that are not found in any other agreement. So when we talk about whether the USMCA represents a loophole, it is not. I know we're going to come back to the US, what could happen on the USMCA side, but these are the strictest rules of origin of any free trade agreement. So what we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of imports coming into Mexico. We are seeing a lot of announcements. This is important to differentiate. We're seeing announcements by uh, Chinese companies, rumors around what BYD might do, what other companies might do in terms of investing in Mexico. But so far, we don't have OEMs producing in Mexico, right? So that's that's where we would get into the question of whether they produce in Mexico to sell into the domestic market, or if it's, as Michael said, a beachhead to export into the US or to the rest of Latin America, right? Potentially looking at Mexico as a hub for exports into uh, the rest of the continent. Now, when you talk about perceptions in Mexico, you know that traditionally there's been a lot of concerns by the Mexican industrial sector about Chinese competition, both in the US market, which is our number one export market, and in the Mexican market. You know, traditionally in industries such as textiles and apparel, footwear, toys, steel, electronics, et cetera. And that is why China has found itself as a frequent uh, client, so to speak, of trade remedy uh, provisions in Mexico, right? So I would say in general, when you look at industry, of course, there is a concern as to uh, that competition coming from China. Uh, I, I would say in general, the, the differentiation here, and I think Ilaria touched upon this, the federal government and the states, well, obviously they're working actively, more the states and the federal government, you know, on, on, on internationally on attracting investment because it's, it, it, if it complies with domestic laws and regulations and creates jobs where states are comp uh, constantly sort of uh, competing for attracting investment, there is a relatively positive view, I would say, in general to investment coming into Mexico. And, but there is this growing awareness as to what would happen in the future if Chinese OEMs set up shop in Mexico and they look to enter the US market, because as we have seen, and of course there's a political season going on in the US, the issue of US-China relations is at the centerpiece of any political discussion taking place in the, in the US. But so far what we're seeing is a lot of imports into Mexico, not uh, many OEMs operating here, uh, in fact, none of them Chinese OEMs producing in Mexico so far, but we know that this is a policy discussion that has to take place between the three North American countries as to what can happen in the future. And maybe I can follow up. Does, does Mexico currently have a system for screening investment? I note that there were some talks between the U.S. and Mexican officials about, um, about the subject but maybe you can share with us, is, is, is it just like a really open investment climate or is, are there any screening mechanisms in place or under consideration? Well, yes, we have an open investment climate. You know, there's not a discrimination based or, or separation based on, on nationality per se. What has been part of the discussions for several years now between the US and Mexico, and it's in the news now, is on specific products, for example, on steel and aluminum, Mexico and the US agreed in 2019 to do away with the 232 tariffs and put in place a monitoring system to avoid transshipping. 
of steel and aluminum products coming into Mexico and then being transshipped into the U.S. But per se, there is not a specific investment screening process that is in place in Mexico and, and certainly not in, in the automotive products. When you look at automotive goods, it would be much harder to bring in a vehicle into Mexico and then try to ship it into the United States claiming to have a, a Mexican origin or, or complying with USMCA rules of origin. But as far in, in general terms, legally, it, it is an open investment environment. In Mexico. Hey, Scott, now over to you. Um, in a recent report called On a Collision Course by the Alliance for American Manufacturing, you and your colleagues really concisely kind of put forward, I think, U.S. concerns, the totality of them with respect to the issues we're discussing today. And you also offer 11 specific policy recommendations. Um, can I just ask you in five minutes, can you like briefly share the highlights or findings of this report and probably maybe like your, your top three policy recommendations? We probably won't have time for all 11. Uh, of course, and I won't articulate all of them, Wendy. Uh, thank you. Thanks to WIDA uh, for this. Thanks for the great panel. I, I actually feel like I don't need to cover a, some of the report because Michael and Alaria, some of the data they've laid out, is you, you can find that in there. The only things that I would add uh, with respect to uh, subsidies or advantages is that there, uh, you know, in addition to the technology that was acquired uh, through joint ventures or forced technology transfer, um, all of these Chinese automakers participate in civil military fusion programs and benefit from uh, military research programs that way in China. Uh, and it's been well documented by a number of sources that they have benefited from the use of uh, forced labor uh, in their supply chains um, as, as well. Um, so uh, given all of that, uh, it might be helpful uh, for me to express why we call this uh, a potential extinction level event. And there's 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 the factor, and Governor Blunt knows this better than anybody, that more than any other industry within manufacturing, uh, the automotive industry is central to uh, so much other economic activity. Um, if you think about semiconductor chips or glass or tires, um, or parts, uh, that is the foundation of the manufacturing ecosystem in the United States. And so um, if we saw reduced market share for U.S. companies, uh, that's going to have a massive effect on the entire manufacturing ecosystem uh, in the United States. The second factor I'll build into this is that we have seen this show before, where we've seen the combination of uh, Chinese uh, Chinese companies starting to dominate uh, global markets uh, in a situation of overcapacity. And we've seen what that does to the rest of the world in terms of its its manufacturing output. It loses market share, uh, worker it places downward pressure on wages. Uh, and we've seen what it does in industries like steel, glass, uh, microelectronics uh, in the United States. It's had a devastating impact uh, and some of these some of these industries will never recover. Some of them, it takes a massive amount of effort to get them to recover. So recognizing this and understanding the centrality of the auto industry to all of this is, I think, important to uh, to stop a problem before it begins, uh, because it will be too late. And, and this gets into the policy recommendations, when Wendy, is that, as you know, most of uh, the trade enforcement actions or remedies that we have are very reactive. Uh, the damage has been done. Um, we've seen plants close down. We've seen market share loss. We've seen a drop uh, in employment uh, or profits or other factors. And um, in this case, uh, I, th I think it's if I th we think it and we argue that it makes sense to get ahead of the game. Now, there are some existing tools that we could sharpen uh, and utilize a little better. Uh, for instance, uh, enforcement of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevent uh, uh, Prevention Act uh, is one of those. Um, sharpening uh, perhaps some of the Section 301, uh, 3 301 measures that are in place. Uh, we argue for the re-implementation of an import surge mechanism uh, that had been in place uh, for, for, for China directly. Um, and we also uh, believe that as we look ahead to USMCA 
uh, review uh, that we we need to uh, tighten up uh, rules of origin and also ensure that they are uh, enforced in a way where uh, countries that aren't a party to the agreement uh, aren't uh, beneficiaries uh, of the terms that are laid out. And I will acknowledge this requires, I think, a novel or new approach to how we design both rules of origin uh, and some of the trade laws, trade enforcement and trade remedies uh, that, that we see. And just the last kind of bucket of policy recommendations that we have goes into the demand side incentives that were uh, created through the Inflation Reduction Act and other mechanisms. And we believe that the foreign entity of concern uh, measures need to be strictly enforced and that some of the application of the clean vehicle tax credits need to be tightened up as well. There's a exclusion for leased vehicles uh, from some of the uh, rules of origin terms that 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 is that, that we think is problematic. Uh, but there's things that we can do uh, in that bucket as well. I should note that uh, there are already some proposals out there that have been offered uh, both by the administration in terms of uh, uh, reviewing uh, data security concerns with respect to connected vehicles that may be manufactured by foreign entities of concern and uh, an announcement of proposed rulemaking at the Department of Commerce. Uh, we've seen legislation proposed um, by Senator Hawley, by Senator Rubio. Uh, we've seen several Democratic senators uh, contact the administration, urging them to, to explore this a little further as well. Uh, and we know that USTR is actively looking into this. Now, the 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 issue with respect to um to to Mexico I think is is the most immediate one because I will acknowledge that you know there there's no dealership network the 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 safety standard issues uh brand recognition those are high hurdles for Chinese companies to overcome uh but where there is a will there is a way uh and so I I I think that we need to get ahead of this uh a little bit um instead of uh, instead of being on our heels Thanks. Um, and just to follow up too, you didn't mention the MFN tariff because to be honest, if you're a Chinese um, or any foreign investor in Mexico, one option is to meet the rule of the, the stringent rule of origin for automotive, um, you know, for automotive components under the USMCA to get a zero tariff. But our tariff on autos in general is 2.5%. So can potentially car company, foreign car, car companies in Mexico live up to the substantial transformation rule of origin and then benefit from a 2.5% tariff? If you're a Chinese company exporting from China right now, you're experiencing a 27.5% tariff. So do you go, do, does your report look at the MFN tariff or make recommendations? I know there have been some congressional proposals here to look at even updating the MFN tariff, which, which of course, and this audience knows better than anyone, involves a lot of other global issues and WTO issues. But just curious, is that on your mind as well, Scott? Uh, Wendy, it is on our mind, and uh, we uh, we raise the issue. I, I don't know that we answer it in our report, but there are a couple of different uh, cuts at how you get at this, I think, and that's been reflected in, um, you know, both the I think the legislation that Senator Hawley, Senator Rubio, and some of the other approaches are looking at either uh, applying it uh, on a company specific basis, if you could do that again, which is, you know, going to be a, a, I think, a novel interpretation. Yeah, hold that uh, thought because we're going to get it, into that. exactly. <laughs> but 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 the answer is yes. I I do think that 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 is something that will have to be addressed. Absolutely. Okay, and now over to Governor Blunt. Um, maybe you can share with us U.S. industry's perspective here, because U.S. industry um, is an exporter to the rest of the world. It's U.S. car companies are exporters from China. U.S. car companies are um, part of the North American supply chain. Um, and, I, you know, maybe have some competing interests here, but I'd be interested in you sharing kind of where U.S. car companies come out on, um, on, this trend, on the trends we're seeing, particularly in Mexico, but globally as well from Chinese car companies. Sure. And uh, I want to thank uh, WIDA and the Asia Society for uh, having me and assembling uh, such a great uh, a great panel and uh, I'm, I'm, I know I've already uh, learned uh, from some of my uh, colleagues on the panel so 
appreciate this opportunity. And, uh, you know, the, the auto industry is important to the United States. Um, we really are the bedrock of American manufacturing. We're the foundation of American manufacturing. We're three to four percent of U.S. GDP, typically the leading uh, manufacturing export sector for, for our country. So it really does have a tremendous economic uh, impact. And we definitely are concerned by the unprecedented surge of exports of, uh, from China to the rest of the world. And as was pointed out, as little as four years ago, it was less than a million vehicles. In 2023, more than 5 million Chinese built motor vehicles. And it is important to know, too, it's not just EVs. Really, only about 25 to 30 percent of those uh, vehicle exports were EVs. The rest were uh, traditional internal combustion engines. So that export surge is concerning. We know it's driven by overcapacity, which is a recurring theme in Chinese industrial policy, uh, and then massive government subsidies uh, and support. And uh, we've already seen an impact uh, in export markets around the world that have traditionally been important to uh, the United States. Uh, the only reason we've not seen that uh, domestic effect, of course, is the Section 301 tariffs that are in, in place today. Um, we don't really see this as a Mexico or USMCA issue. Uh, obviously, there's you know proximity between the Mexico and the United States, but uh, we believe the threat of Chinese motor vehicles could come from anywhere that China sets up operations. So we don't see this as a USMCA or Mexico specific problem. It's really a larger global challenge. Um, as has been pointed out, the USMCA rule of origin is by far the most stringent in the world. There's nothing else like it in any other free trade agreement. There is no way any Chinese uh, company will be able to meet the rule of origin with an operation in, in Mexico or, or anywhere where else. So they will be paying the same tariff uh, as exports from any other market to the United States. So we don't really see it as a Mexico problem or USMCA problem, uh, but we do see it as a challenge and one that we're thinking about how we can uh, best address and protect uh, a very important industry for our country. Um, you know, in terms of sort of retaliation in a domestic market or through supply chain restrictions, those are always possibilities when you're addressing trade policy in another uh, country. Uh, so we don't really have unique concerns in this case, but this is an industry that's really you know, evolving rapidly. It's increasingly competitive. Uh, so it's important that government policy work to set a level uh, playing field. And ultimately, our focus is on making the best cars for our customers and markets uh, all, all around the world. Well, thank you for that. Um, maybe, Ken, I can turn to you on the point that um, Scott raised, and that's the one, you know, do we need to start thinking about restricting um, imports, not just based on, a, on the origin of the product, but maybe nationality of the supplier? Um, and how does that work? And how would Mexico view that? Let's just say if the U.S. were to say no more, you know, no, no imports from Chinese car companies invested in Mexico, because you mentioned your states and localities are providing incentives for investment. You welcome this investment. How does how would Mexico think through these issues? Well, it's actually a big challenge, Wendy, and, and I'll go back to the point Governor Blunt made, which is very strong, which is this is a global challenge. It's a reality that as, as uh, countries that are very much dependent on the automotive sector, I mean, you, you look at the fact that within the USMCA region, 22% of total trade under the USMCA is in the auto sector. So this is a strategic sector, a sector that we should continue to nurture and to strengthen. And obviously, uh, we have to find ways to face uh, th these challenges of Chinese overcapacity. But as the governor mentioned, you know, we do have the strictest rules of origin uh, of any trade agreement in the USMCA. So I don't think as far as looking at the policy tools that are out there and that could be, uh, you know, considered at the North American level, the issue is not the USMCA itself. You you refer to, for example, the two and a half percent MFN tariff that the U.S., uh, you know, uh, you know, is, uh, has established for many, many years. There's a big question there whether the U.S. will be uh, willing to move to increase that and what impact that would have, you know, in terms of other countries trying to increase their tariffs against the U.S. as well. But, for example, uh, the re one of the reasons we see that the Chinese OEMs may not be already 
uh, setting up shop in Mexico because they have other options as well. If you look at the U.S. Uh, Korea trade agreement, you know the 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 the, the chorus rules of origin are much, are not as strict as the USMCA rules of origin. So conceivably, China could be producing in Korea, complying with a, a US rules of origin under that agreement and exporting to the US. So we have to look at the entire picture, right? I think that uh, in terms of what Mexico or even Canada within the USMCA sphere could, could consider doing, rather than, than right off the bat talking about changing the USMCA rules, which I think once again, that are, are strong, there are other uh, cooperation initiatives, and we could that we could look at. Uh, Scott mentioned, for example, on, on issues of, of labor. You know, I think there is a strong policy in Mexico to try to prevent uh, imports that come from uh, uh, regions of the world where there's violation of human rights or forced labor or uh, child labor. These are uh, uh, principles that are established in the USMCA. You know, so looking at how these provisions can be in a way uh, converge of what the approaches in the US, what the approaches in Canada and what the approaches in Mexico is a way of looking at it. Uh, also a uh, trade remedy, of course. Uh, and, and I understand Scott's concerns that this is sort of a reactive measure that takes some time, but there's also US policy uh, that can policies that can be put into place in terms of uh, import surges, the, the, uh, the China safeguard that used to be in place. So there's many elements that can be looked at, you know, before you start looking at, at, at USMCA provisions. I think at the end of the day, this is not a, a position that the Mexican government right now is taking. As I said, there's an open investment environment, but I think inevitably it'll be important to have a conversation between the US, Mexico and Canada as to what policies can be taken uh, regionally. I think that going into the direction where you modify the rules of origin and you actually target a country to exclude them just by virtue of being uh, Chinese uh, is difficult with the current international trading rules, right? Whether it's the USMCA or the WTO rules. How, to, how do you justify that? And how do you, if you Im implement that, how do you not get into a slippery slope where other countries start discriminating against North American products just by virtue of being North American and by claiming that they can be a danger to national security of other export markets that are important to North America. So I think there's many policy uh, uh, tools that are out there that we should look at first and cooperation between the three North American countries to facilitate trade. Uh, the best way to compete with China is to have, in my opinion, more integration in North America, regulatory and standards convergence, integration of production clusters, and increasing regional suppliers of OEMs in North America. So there is there is a defensive position to be taken on on this uh, on Chinese overcapacity, but there is also a proactive position that North America should take to increase its own competitiveness. And in that way, yeah, I think North American further integration of the North American auto industry is the way to go. Hey, Ilaria, maybe I can turn to you and you may want to comment on what Ken just said, but I also wanted to ask your views on the recent proposal by the Commerce Department to impose some like data restrictions or looking at these electric vehicles as data collection machines and basing regulations on uh, restrictions on that basis. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think that that's important because it's important to, to highlight that this is a highly preemptive conversation we're having, right? There are basically almost no imports of EVs from China to the US. It's about 2% of all imports of EVs that the US, uh, you know, of all EVs uh, imported in the US, 2% come from China. We looked at the numbers. It's essentially just Polestar, which, by the way, is a company that's planning to produce in the U.S. domestically uh, in the U.S. at some point. Um, we looked at the numbers from Mexico. I think, you know, Ken, Ken already sort of uh, said this, but we looked at the numbers. There is no evidence for transshipment of vehicles through Mex from Mex for, through, through Mexico. A lot of them are staying in Mexico. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the, as, as Ken mentioned, there's a lot of Chinese EVs being sold or Chinese cars in general being sold in Mexico. Um, and and so I think, you know, I, I'm not particularly worried, actually, uh, given all the types of regulations we have in place right now that uh, that we're going to see the surge of exports from China to U.S. anytime soon because of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, 
which is starting to be implemented more um, in the automotive sector because of the current tariffs, because there's conversations now about increasing tariffs even further in the United States. So that may be coming um, with the 301 review. And then now we may have some sort of restriction on connected vehicles, which of course most electric vehicles are connected as well, right? So I don't think this is something, um, you know, I think the US is now putting in place a lot of different instruments that are probably going to re restrict that, that, that flow. Uh, but this gets to a, the, what I think Ken mentioned earlier, that there's a difference between exports and investment. Um, and I think that's just important to keep in mind because uh, when we're talking about exports, it's not just Chinese brands, right? The single largest exporters of exporter uh, of EVs in, from China is Tesla. That's 34% of EV exports in 2023 were Teslas. Now, they're not Teslas that are going to the United States. They're my, they're, we don't know exactly where they're going, probably Europe, Asia, um, uh, perhaps some other places as well, maybe Australia, but that's just to point out that, you know, using China as a manufacturing base is not just something that Chinese companies are contemplating, but there's a, plenty of Western companies that are thinking about that as well. Um, and, and that is, I think, a challenge for compet competitiveness, the industrialization and the West in general. I think certainly if you talk to, to folks in Europe, that is a concern they, they really have. And then there's the separate issue of, how concerned are we if Chinese companies start producing abroad? Um, and I think we really need to confront, I think the, the, the question that you mentioned, Wendy, is do we really want to regulate uh, companies based on their ownership rather than where they're producing? Um, and, and I think that, that, you know, I completely agree that's a slippery slope. It's also very complicated given how companies are structured these days. And I think it also, again, gets back to the question of, what happens when you know a Chinese company, say BYD, this isn't just hypothetical, right? Is refining the 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 lithium in um in Chile, um, maybe then produces the battery in um you know another country and uh, and then um, assembles the vehicle in in a third country, right? And these are all local workers, it's value added in that country. The inputs that are coming from China are probably, you know, could be limited to a certain extent. Um, it's in a way they're they're meeting those diversification targets that the United States itself has set. Now, I'm not saying that's entirely, you know, that's entirely. I'm sure there's plenty of questions over national security. There's plenty of questions over economic security. But I think we should really think about the differences because I would encourage us to think of of also how we could take advantage of these trends, right? It's still pulling out, it's it's moving that production outside of China. I think that could have potential benefits. Um, I mean, just, I think there's 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 some significant differences there and the different types of threats to the United States. And I think we should be trying to think about what are economic threats, what are national security threats. Um, and, and in all of this, let's keep in mind that American companies have not been particularly successful at investing and being innovative in this industry. I think Michael writes a lot about how Detroit has underestimated Chinese companies and has underestimated the trend towards EVs. So thinking also about how to keep comp our industry competitive while protecting it, I think is going to be important. So Michael, let me let me turn turn it over to you. Do you think that the United States is overreacting with its concerns, or do you see, um, you know, potential increases in investment and exports a, a genuine threat to U.S. automotive industry um, and U.S. workers. And also, I just ask you, is there any evidence that Chinese automotive companies are gravitating towards countries with whom the United States has concluded free trade agreements with? I've read Morocco somewhere, so I just want to throw that out there. <laughs> right, Morocco. Right. So absolutely, uh, the United States is not overreacting. This is definitely a serious threat to the well-being of automotive manufacturing in, in North America, the United States. So no question, it's real. And Ken mentioned moments ago, it's not just Mexico. And he cited the example of Korea. Guess what? We already have a real live example of that. Geely, one of Ch China's leading automakers, has a joint venture with Renault in Korea to manufacture product for export to the United States. It hasn't happened yet but all the mechanisms are in place and we can count on that pretty much happening in the near future. That's one example. Second one, of course, is Volvo, which is Chinese owned, already has a manufacturing plant in South Carolina. 
they'll add Polestar manufacturing this year. And of interest, this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but because that plant exports some products back to Europe, Volvo's back to Europe, Polestar is back to Europe, Volvo is now going to be allowed to import one of its products from China, more or less duty free into the United States as an offset. So, oh, you North South Carolina plant exports to Europe, good, you get credit on this import of a Volvo from China into the US. So there are all kinds of workarounds beyond you know, our topic today, Mexico. And the Chinese have such a decisive advantage when it comes to cost, that it is a real concern. If I can pull the lens back, was as I'm listening to everybody, sometimes it occurs to me, and it's almost like we're going to the Olympics and it's China against the United States in the finals. And the U.S. suspects that because of subsidies, China has unfair advantage called steroids that allows their team to perform above and beyond our team. What do we do about that? Well, China, show us your test, drug testing. No, we're, we're not into showing other countries our drug testing. No, that's our business. And by the way, from China's perspective, that's how we're set up. That's how we prepare for the Olympics. It's none of your business. So what do we do now? We have a real dilemma. It isn't as if we're talking to like-minded partners in Japan or Korea. This is two different mindsets to state capitalism, free market capitalism. How does that play out? How do we respond? Very different from anything we faced before. Scott, how would you respond to um, some of the points that have been raised that like as of now, you know, there are really very few, if any, electric Chinese electric vehicles in the U.S. market. Um, and, you know, as Ken pointed out, Chinese companies are thinking about and seriously thinking about investing in Mexico. Um, but I think you are emphasizing the need to kind of be proactive um, and not wait until damage has happened to, to, to take needed policy steps. But I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is that an accurate characterization? Yes, it, it is. As I said, we've seen this before play out in real time in so many other industries, Wendy, from steel to glass to solar panels. And we've seen all the workarounds, uh, even if we've set up uh, direct trade barriers. Uh, for instance, solar is the perfect example of what's happening in that space. And it, it and it's completely quashing the, the domestic uh, effects of what we're trying to do to build up solar manufacturing in the United States. And so, and this is an industry we're trying to regrow in the United States. It, you know, for, for automotive, for the automotive sector, this is well established, as Governor Blunt pointed out, it's central to our economic functioning in so many different parts of the country, is that we have to be uh, ahead of it here. And I'm, I'm, I want to make one other comment. I heard uh, uh, former President Trump's comments on CNBC when he was asked this question about China and autos. And I completely disagree with him. I do not think we want to welcome BYD or any other company that, that's uh, supported by the Chinese government to set up shop in the United States and compete against our companies and other entrants who have to operate in a completely different set of market circumstances, including the cost of capital. It is just truly unfair. And so I do think in this case, we need to be uh, preemptive uh, and this is very specific because China is more than an economic competitor. Uh, it is a strategic challenger, and that presents an entirely different set of circumstances than any of this other global competition that we might see around the world. Um, Governor Blunt, how do, how do the car, U.S. car companies feel about potentially increasing tariffs um, against Chinese imports of vehicles? particularly given that our car companies are invested in China and may be concerned about counter retaliation. Sure. So, um, you know, we, we think the U.S. government should continue to fully assess uh, the, the Chinese threat and the fact that there is overcapacity and massive subsidies and a, a different economic model that um, doesn't provide the sort of laying, level playing field that, that we would like. Um, I mentioned we've already seen an impact in Chinese exports and other markets. Uh, the only reason we've not seen a domestic impact is the Section 301 uh, tariffs that are in place. So 
Um, we think it, you know, we certainly support maintaining the 27.5% tariff that exists now, um, at least certainly in the, in the short term, and, uh, and uh, would urge just continued analysis and evaluation of what the Chinese threat is, because the Section 301 tariff really is the only reason we believe that you've not seen uh, a surge of Chinese uh, imports into the United States. Ken, we've already we've we've discussed the USMCA a bit. I mean, there'll be a the the big review of the USMCA in 2026. Um, you mentioned, you know, the rules of origin provisions. Are there other parts of the USMCA that could be strengthened or tweaked in a in a in a way that could help address some of the challenges that we're discussing today? Or is it really just rules of origin? Well, I, I think it's mainly uh, within the USMCA rules. I think that uh, North America is well prepared to deal with this challenge, specifically on the USMCA and the rules of origin. A lot of the elements that we're discussing here, I think are, are very valid, but should be addressed not necessarily within the USMCA, although there are some areas, for example, where, as I mentioned before, the three countries have committed to uh, specific labor standards, both in our countries. And now, in addition to what we have in the USMCA in terms of uh, you know, protecting uh, labor rights and on union democracy, et cetera, what we could talk about as part of a side discussion that's not necessarily to be included or requires a reopening of the USMCA is how the three countries of North America approach the issue of uh, labor. You know, these provisions that I think are very advanced in the U.S. and trying to restrict imports from countries where there's violation of human rights. Are we up to the same standards in Mexico and in Canada as the U.S. is pursuing? That's I think that's a, a valid question to 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 discuss. And then it's interesting what the U.S. is doing in this investigation on the Department of Commerce, the issue of data collection. The executive order that the president uh, signed in terms of of requesting this this analysis, I think that goes takes the issue a step forward, right? Because it talks about what impacts uh, you could have from these intelligent vehicles in terms of data collection, privacy of information, uh, national security issues. I think that uh, rather than thinking right now of changing the USMCA, of reopening it, uh, which would, in my opinion, open a big Pandora's box, you know, if, if the review of 2026 re actually becomes a renegotiation, what we should have in 2026 is a reaffirmed commitment to strengthening uh, free trade within the region and relaunching the USMCA for another 16 years as is established in the agreement. I think we can work on uh, cooperation initiatives to make sure that there are no other loopholes that may exist or other uh, ability for products that come in either uh, heavily subsidized or that uh, you know are in a way uh, not complying with labor provisions and labor standards that we have in, in North America. Okay, well, we're gonna need to wrap up now. What I'd like to do is just kind of um, turn to each speaker and just ask you to, you know, one minute share anything that you haven't shared already that we didn't have time to ask or what you want the viewers, you know, what, what's the main takeaway you want the viewers to um, to lead this webinar with Scott, maybe I can start with you. Put you on the spot, <laughs> yeah, Wendy. Thank you. Um, I had an answer, which is good. So uh, it, I, I think the important thing is that the U.S. adopt a strategy sooner rather than later. Uh, we've laid out a number of tools that could be used. I think the panelists have offered some additional ideas uh, and also some additional areas where we need to explore as well. But I think it's important for the U.S. government to have a proactive effort, uh, whether it applies to the application of trade laws or data or the USMCA, uh, so that we don't see this repeat, uh, you know, a repeat performance of the kind of deindustrialization that we've had in the past because of Chinese overcapacity and state support, whether directly or in global competition or through uh, through routed through other countries as well. And by the way, thank you. I, I think this is the beginning of an awesome conversation that we're going to be having. I think we're going to need the, a part two, but um, let's finish the part one first. Alaria, any parting thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, I think we, I won't get into all the trade remedies and, and every, all the instruments I think that have been mentioned today. And I, I think they're all important and we should be paying attention to them. But I think, you know, what really I would encourage everybody to think about is sort of the trade-offs, right? 
Um, there, there always are trade-offs when you introduce these, these types of restrictions. Uh, some may be necessary, but I think at this point, we're at a point where we're seeing a conflation of what are economic interests, national security interests, climate change interests. Um, and it's it's very hard to disentangle these things and think through what the consequences would will be. So I, I, while I think you know there is a real and, and very tangible threat to the American automotive industry that's coming from Chinese vehicles, I also think um, that the, we do need some innovation and we do need some competition. Um, so I think figuring out exactly how to make that all work is going to be uh, the hard work of the coming years. I think that's that's an excellent point. Um, Governor Blunt, over to you. Oh, you're on mute. It's been an excellent uh, panel uh, discussion and appreciate being a part of it. Um, this is a significant you know, global challenge. It's not a regional, uh, a regional challenge. It's a global challenge for um, the U.S. industry and uh, policymakers to, to respond to. And we think it's critical that um, folks are thinking about how we can use every available tool to protect our national and economic uh, security. Good. Ken. Thank you very much, Wendy. Well, I mean, I would conclude just by saying that, yes, we have a real challenge. Overcapacity in Chinese vehicles is something that we are seeing throughout the world. We're seeing it in our region. We're seeing it in Mexico. And I think the ultimate goal that we should pursue when we analyze the situation is how do we strengthen the competitiveness of the North American auto sector? And there's many ways to approach it. Uh, we've been discussing some of what I would call the, the defensive policies that, that need to be analyzed and need to be addressed. Uh, there has to be, I think, first of all, a trilateral discussion between Mexico, Canada and the U.S. as to the nature of the challenge, the implications of any policy decisions that are taken, because there is a, a, another side to every story. If we start restricting and discriminating against Chinese products, other countries might do the same. There's also implications if, for example, the U.S. increases its, its MFN tariffs. So all of these should be a part of a major discussion between the three countries where we emphasize how to strengthen the competitiveness of the auto sector. So that is something that Elia mentioned in terms of innovation, new materials. We, we have made some progress in the past few years in terms of, for example, trying to loosen our dependency or, or move away from the dependency of key inputs to the sector, such as semiconductors, lithium batteries, et cetera. So we could, we could should continue with that positive agenda and at the same time, address the challenges that, uh, that are presented by overcapacity of Chinese vehicles coming into our region towards the future. Michael, you kicked it off. You have the last word. All right. Yeah, uh, I may have the last word, but you have the second okay, last word. Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a word about leverage and the fear of retaliation. So in the past, the United States was concerned if we're tough on China, our automakers in China may not get market access. Well, the reality is that Detroit 3 are already on their way out the door from China. Sales are down by more than half in the last five years, and the trend is bound to continue. In fact, I think we will see them exit the China market before 2030 for lots of different reasons, but that's a reality. So you say, okay, what's the downside of saying, China, we, you're not really welcome in our market? Um, not so much. Now, on the other hand, Europe's a different story. Overnight, we saw the CEO of Mercedes come out and say, what we want, we should reduce tariffs on Chinese cars coming into Europe. What? So you think, well, the there's leverage play there because Mercedes still needs the China market. That's much less true for US automakers. So something to keep in mind for negotiators as they come to the table with the Chinese. Well, with that, I just wanna thank our speakers for their words of wisdom. Um, including kind of the the kind of the consensus view that we should be developing kind of a strategic, proactive, offensive, affirmative agenda, not just a defensive, in, um, responsive agenda, and keep trade offs in mind. And I would just I know we have some folks from um, the government on the line, so I would urge you as you start thinking through these options um, to keep some of these words of wisdom in the back of your minds. And with that, I want to personally thank the panelists. Excellent discussion. I'd love to reconvene this group. But Ken, you're going to have the real last word. So over to you. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Really fantastic discussion. Incredibly lucid really easy to follow, uh, so much information you guys were sharing. 
we did weave in, we had a lot of questions come in. We weaved a lot of those topics into our discussion. We're also going to download those and share them with the panelists so they can see all the questions that were asked, which also had some specific comments and mentioned a couple thoughts for different speakers. So thank you all very much. Agree with Wendy. Would love to have you all back on. There's so much more to dig into here. We'll probably get into a little bit of these issues when we have our China Intensive Trade Seminar again in May as well. So thank you all very, very much. Everyone take care. We look forward to seeing everyone again soon. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.